All right, good to have you all this evening on this uh, night before Thanksgiving. Uh, <clears throat> hope you have time uh, for your families tomorrow. Have a good time if that's who you're going to be with. Uh, that sort of thing. But let's do this. Let's go to Psalm 100. Uh, tomorrow we're giving thanks, right, for uh, different reasons, th that sort of thing. We go back to the pilgrims his historically. Um, I have a book and I left it downstairs. It's 365 devotionals based on the pilgrim story that comes right from the pilgrims, from their writings, the logs of the ship, the Mayflower, uh, that sort of thing. And it, it, it's been very interesting to read that. Uh, I started doing that in June, I think it was. But uh, gives you a history of how they met, you know, got, why they left, how they got here, how they met the Indians. Uh, and, and those sort of things. And uh, so it's interesting as far, as far as that goes. But let's do this. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about Thanksgiving. And so let's notice Psalm 100, only five verses here. So I'm going to read them. Now I, I use the New American Standard. It says, Shout jo uh, joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord's gladness. Come before him with loving or joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into gates with thanksgiving. Actually enter into his gate with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good his loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. Now, what we find is this through what I've uh, read and, and homework I've done on this. Psalm 93 through Psalm 100 are what we what the Jews call festive anthems, festive anthems. Now, we'll explain that as we go on. Uh, they were used for worship in the second temple, all right, the second temple services, and they and they were used uh, prior to the morning offerings, where they were sung before the offerings uh, were made. Now, the occasion for their composition was the uh, deliverance from Babylon, okay, and the dedication of the temple in uh, 405 B.C., uh, if you'll come with me to Ezra, all right, Ezra chapter number six. All right, let's see. There's Esther, Nehemiah, and there's Ezra. Okay, let's come over to chapter number six here, and uh, let's read verses 14 through 16, where it says this. And the elders of the Jews were successful in building through the prophes prophesying of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Edo. And they finished building according to the command of God of Israel and the decree of Cyrus, Darius, Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Now notice there's three kings there that that this building uh, uh, took place over, okay? The reign of three kings. This temple was completed on the third day of the month Adar. It was the sixth year in the reign of King Darius. And the sons of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy, okay? With joy. Now, when we notice chapter 5, with me please, okay, chapter number 5, notice verses 1 and 2. When the prophet, prophets, Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel who were over them, then Zerubbabel the son of Shetaliah and Jeshua the son of Zodokah, arose and began to rebuild the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, 
and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. Now this, uh, this took place over a 21 year period with the kings there, okay? And so that's interesting. If you read Ezra and Nehemiah, you can read about how, how all this happened, okay? Now, what I find interesting is this. It took 21 years. Uh, I have a uh, Hebrew study Bible downstairs. Now, it's a whole Bible, but it, 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 it's written uh, for Hebrews, <laughs> believing Hebrews, okay, and believing Gentiles. But it's a Hebrew study Bible, it's called. And there, in their Bible, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah are one book. And it's kind of funny to, to go and try to find the different books of the Old Testament because they're not laid out like ours are, all right? So you have to look at the table of contents. So Ezra and Nehemiah are one book, and they have between chapter 6 and 7 in Ezra a parenthesis where you find the book of Esther, all right? And so those three books then all go together, and they have to do with the Jews returning, of course, uh, to the land, those that did, they were, uh, uh, the best guess that I got from history uh, is about 42,000 Jews came back from Babylon and other places uh, and, and returned back to Judah, actually began in Judah before they, they spread out again a little bit, all right, as, as we see that. So the theme of uh, these chapters that I shared with you, 95 through uh, 100 is actually the sovereignty of God, okay? And it's very interesting when you when you look at it. Um, Mr. Bullinger, you know, when he does outlines, he uses introspection, which means like A, B, B, A, and the two A's go together, the two B's go together. And what we have here is this, introversion is what it's called. Uh, in fact, come to 93 with me, and we'll start there. Psalm 93, please. And I'll give you these real quickly. And you'll understand what's going on here. All right, Psalm 93. Now notice what it says here uh, in verses 1 and 2. The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord has clothed and girded himself with strength. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. Your throne is established from old. You are from everlasting. So Psalm 93 has to do then with reigning. Now we're going to skip 94 and I'll share, share with why here in a few minutes. But come over to chapter uh, Psalm 95. All right. So as 93 says, this is about the reign of God. 95 says, oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence, now notice, with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. And of course, the shouting was actually singing uh, for the Jews. Now then we come to uh, 96, verse 1. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Now we notice that in Psalm 100. Now this had, you know, we, when we talk about audience relevance, we're talking about those Jews that came back uh, into the land to establish the city again, rebuilt a temple, all right, that sort of thing. But the whole earth and the whole world's involved in this, so we can see it as as prophetic also. Okay, eschatologically, if you want to say that, because it's connected with the Abrahamic covenant. Okay, as, as you see this. So, sing to the Lord all the earth, verse uh, 2. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell the glory among the nations. Back to the idea that Israel would be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And take God's salvation word out to, to these folks, all right? So that's 96. So 93 we see rain, 95 and 96 singing. Now notice 97 with me, Psalm 97, okay? And let's just look at verse one. The Lord reigns. 
Let the earth rejoice. Let the many islands be glad. All right? The many islands be glad. So then I'm going to turn my, my page to page two here, and we see alteration here. So now in 98, Psalm 98, notice what it says in verse one, okay, and two. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done wonderful things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained the victory for him. Now, what's this have to do with? What does this have coming back into the land, okay? The Lord hath made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. Now, notice how this, keep pop, this keeps popping up, right? Mm -hmm. Then we see, if, if you would, in Psalm 99, we're back to reigning. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He is enthroned above the cherubim. Let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is exalted above the peoples. Okay? Exalted above the peoples. Of course, then that brings us where? That brings us right back to Psalm 100, where we began. Okay? Where we began. Now, the reason we skip 94 is because 94 has to do with God vindicating his people and and generally we'd say this has to do with his reign but it doesn't say it but in context that's what it is and him showing his glory and reminding israel why they were taken to captivity okay uh, i mean they just got lazy in their worship of god and their idea of who god was and they became you know in general they became idolaters and, and god took them out of the land so that's what 94 is about so, in the time then of the second temple, each day of the week had a special psalm. Now, I'm going to say this. Uh, uh, prior to the offering of the morning offering, okay, morning sacrifice, we say, they sang certain psalms from day one, which would be Sunday, through day seven, which would be their Sabbath, okay, their Sabbath. Now, let me share. I'm not going to turn to these, but let me give them to you so you understand uh, what was going on there, okay? So on Sunday, they, they do Psalm 24, which has to do the, with the king of glory entering Zion, okay? That's Psalm 24. Then on Monday, they would sing Psalm 48. That has to do with the beauty and the glory of Zion. So Monday had to do with God entering Zion. Tuesday, the beauty and glory of Zion. Uh, on Tuesday it was Psalm 82, okay, which had to do with unjust judgments, okay, that were rebuked. In other words, the people were judging and they shouldn't have been judging, and God's rebuking that, keeping them in line. Then on Wednesday, it's Psalm 94 which has to do with the Lord avenging Israel or vindicating them, okay, and and reminding them who they are, okay, because they are now his people again. That's where we are. Now, on Thursday, it was Psalm 81, okay, which has to do with God's goodness and Israel's waywardness. So, so God's going to keep reminding them. Bring that before them, see if you can straighten them out. Now on Friday then, we had Psalm 93 through Psalm 100, which has to do with what? Reigning and singing of praise, okay? Reigning and singing of praise, 93 through 100. Then finally, on the Sabbath, it was Psalm 92, which was praise for God's goodness. Let me turn back there to Psalm 92, all right? And just verses one and two is what I'll read. There are 15 verses in that there. Here it says, it is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises for your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night. Okay, so that's what was sung on the Sabbath, 
when they had their Sabbath worship uh, there at the temple, okay? Now, I, I brought these to your attention so you'll understand there was a pattern to the worship of the Jews in the second temple. And, and I started a study here last week on the temple in, uh, for the purpose of looking at the temple, the purpose of the temple, and the first mention of it's in, uh, I think it's first Samuel with, with David, but it has to do with the tent of worship, okay, which we call the tabernacle, right? But as you go through scripture, when you get to the second temple here, it never indicates that God came and dwell there, okay? And of course, that second temple is a temple that Herod is gonna take and rebuild because the Jews were limited, even though they received materials from the kings, all right, uh, to rebuild the, the temple. It wasn't the edifice that the first temple was, okay, that Solomon uh, put up. And, and uh, Herod then, uh, when he took over as the king, okay, in his own view, he started rebuilding it again, okay, and upgrading it, if you believe, or, or uh, please, okay, with that sort of thing. But notice with me Psalm 100, because this is what we're interested in with, with the second temple here, and the worship that goes on, and i like to see if we can make this, you know, have meaning for ourselves, okay, meaning for ourselves. Now, when we get this to 100, let me read it one more time. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Mm -hmm. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness to all generations. So what we have here, now remember these are poems that were to be sung, all right, for praise to God. And in this case, we see, it, you know, it happened uh, on the Friday there prior to the Sabbath, okay. And what we find is this, that there's two stanzas here, uh, actually, verses one, two, and three, and then the second one to be four and five. Now notice what we have here in verse number one and two. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the what? All the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Well, the question would be, why? <laughs> okay, why? Well, notice verse number three. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So when you read this, what do we understand? God is Lord, say. He is the creator. Therefore, we should come with shouts of, you know, joyful shouts to the Lord of all what? Of all the earth. And we should serve him with gladness because of who he is. Who is he? He is Lord. He is creator. So that's what this first stanza is all about. When you get to the second stanza, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Now, again, what do we say? Why? Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, give thanks to him, bless his name. Why? Well, let's notice verse five. For the Lord is good. Do you remember when someone called Jesus good master? And he said, there is none good, but whom? You remember that? Mm -hmm. But God. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. So his love, you know, based on his kindness and his goodness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. I mean, there's a year's worth of, of messages right there, loving kindness and faithfulness to all generations, as you see this. As we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, and I don't know if it was a Wednesday or 
a, a, a Sunday, you know, there, there, there's a verse there. I think it's in Numbers of Deuteronomy. It talks about God's faithfulness for 30,000 generations or a thousand generations, you know, and it goes on and on. And so it at least puts, it puts you out 30, 40,000 years, okay, to what he's talking about there. So to, to me, it, it's all interesting. So when we see this, now what I'd like to do, all right, page three, is take a look at verse number four. And I've been doing this more and more. Uh, as I mentioned in a previous study, that most of our translations that we have, you know, into English, of which I have many, okay, are based from the Old Testament Septuagint, the Greek, all right? So the Hebrew was translated into Greek, and then that Greek was put into to English, okay? But when you look at it in terms of the Hebrew and the Aramaic, it gives it a little more personality, I'll say, okay? It's not that the Greek was wrong, but remember what we said, that the, the Greeks perceived God how? Does anybody remember? Stoically. He was stoic. In other words, he was firm. He didn't stand. He did what he did and, and left it, okay? That came from Plato. Uh, but the Hebrews see God, as we saw with Moses, so it was a Sunday morning, saw with Moses when God said, you know, who do I tell him you are? Okay. And, and uh, let me read you a little something here that I didn't know I lived with a, a Hebrew scholar, but I took my notes from a Hebrew scholar and then Susan uh, doubled up on that with the name of God. I shall come to be just as I am coming to be is present perfect tense. I said it was future tense, okay? So it begins in the present and continues into the future. So God's name means that he is and is always now I am and his, <laughs> and it means that he never ceases becoming, yeah. all right? So the point that I made was correct in that God is still becoming, all right? Mm -hmm. And and praise the Lord for that, okay? And and he's not a static being. So what I have done, and this came about because of, uh, uh, what's his last name, Susan? Cham uh, Ventura? Ventura? Cham Ventura, who is a Hebrew scholar, and uh, he has written a number of books but he does all his studies, they're just word studies, okay? Where he gives you the idea of what the Hebrew is talking about. And to me, it, it's, it's fascinating, okay? It's just fascinating. So I've been using these, the study of the Hebrew words is what it amounts to, all right? I have a, a, a about four other references that I use too with, uh, that I have, you know, written by Hebrews, believing Hebrews, rabbis actually that have been really a blessing to me but when we look at verse number four okay uh it, it to me it's interesting uh, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise now the hebrew word for gates okay for gates is shar it's sh i never know if i'm pronouncing it correctly i, I look at the concordance and try to get it but it doesn't help S-H, then get that little apostrophe, uh, A-R, okay, is what it is. And what it literally means is a doorway to pass through, all right? Now, we, you know, we, we recognize a gate to be that. You come to a house with a fence with a gate, you open the gate, walk in, shut the gate, right? And so that's the idea. But in Hebrew, it has the idea not just of passing through something, all right, through this gate, but it's a meeting place. It's a place, okay, a gate that takes you into the presence of someone so you can meet with him, all right? That you can meet with him as you see this. So to understand this verse, it should be expressed then in this way, all right? Thanksgiving is a gateway 
to enter his courts. See, it's written in our Bibles, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. But the Hebrew idea is thanksgiving is a gateway to enter his courts. Okay, thanksgiving. So the conjunction that we have in, in, in my Bible there, uh, it, it has uh, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Uh, the Hebrew does not have that conjunction and there, okay, as, as we see that. So the Hebrew then for enter, as we go on with verse number four, okay, as as we see this, enter uh, is boyo, B-O apostrophe U. And it has the idea of you come. You come. It's it's almost an imperative. You know what an imperative is? It's a command. You come. It's God speaking. Come, say, is, is what it's all about. Uh, we, we call it in the English a simple perfect uh, uh, form, but the idea here, it's already completed or it's past. Okay? So we add to the phrase then, again, you come to meet him in thanksgiving. Thus, a statement, okay, it becomes a statement of fact. So when you are thankful to God, all right, you automatically meet him. Remember, the thankfulness is what gets you in to his presence through that gate, all right, in, into that gate, and you come into his presence. Therefore, thanksgiving then is the gateway to the courts of God. Now, let's see if I can give you a little illustration. All right. Uh, I love to read. And, and, and Susan and I, before we go to bed, well, we do it in bed. Okay. <laughs> and, and we read. And, and she loves Louis L'Amour, you know. And I have a, another, a, a number of authors that I like. Uh, uh, Perot, uh, Agatha Christie, in Mysteries, that sort of thing. But it's, it's done, you know, get a chapter or two in before you fall asleep, that kind of thing. But uh, what I have found is this. Every author of every book, even Christian books, doesn't go right to the publisher. They have agents. And the agents are the ones that take the manuscript to the publisher and recommend that they go through the manuscript. And of course, publishers have what we call editors, right? And, and the point that I learned, even from uh, Louis L'Amour, I mean, who, who wrote hundreds of books, okay, you know, the cowboy books and books about the sea. He was a sailor for a while. Uh, he said, none of my books would have ever gotten published without an agent. So the agent was a go-between, okay, yeah. uh, between the author and the publisher. So he was the one that the author trusted and that the publisher trusted, see? And so that's how the book got there. Now, what we're finding here in, in Psalm 4 is that this thanksgiving, okay, <laughs> This thanksgiving is the go-between that allows an individual to go to the publisher, publisher being God, all right, being God. So <laughs> when, when we see this then and, and look at it, thanksgiving is a gateway, okay? It's the way into God. It's what God recognizes when people come to his presence. So then the Hebrew word for courts is chaster, C-H-A-S-T-E-R. And what this means, it's the innermost compound of an area. So it'd be like an office. It's a place where business was done in the Jewish world. And this is the idea of the Psalm. You're, you're coming in the presence of God. The Thanksgiving is getting you there. You're coming into his presence for business, say, for business. Now, 
in the Syriac and Aramaic, it's a dwelling place or a private place where business takes place. Okay. And the, the best example of this would be it's where a bridegroom or a gentleman who wanted to be a bridegroom would go in and meet the father of the girl he wanted to marry privately. And so he could talk to the father. The father could talk to him to decide if he wants this young man to come into his family. Okay. Or, or no, for, for whatever reasons. And, and this way, if, if the father said, no, I don't think he's worthy of my daughter. Okay. The young man wouldn't be embarrassed in the community. Okay. But the father would say yes or no in, in this place of, of business. Okay. Y'all, y'all follow that. So it was done privately. Now, then <laughs> in praise, Okay, a verse four, we enter into a serious discussion that are very private between God and us. And if we just take this to the Jewish mindset here, you know, you go to audience relevance. This is how they viewed this. They were coming not as a congregation, say, but as an individual. This is what God was trying to teach them. And of course, we as individuals, individual believers, and, and I've said this for years and years and years, I really don't believe that we come to praise God on Sunday mornings. We come to learn how to play, pre, praise God on Sunday mornings because we come to learn about who our great God is, see? And knowing that, then during the course of our lives, our days, not only knowing who he is, but who we are, we can then praise him as we walk on this earth, okay? So the Hebrew word for praise then, in verse number four, is, let's see if I can get this a, a go, by tekelach, okay, or tekelar, B-I-T-E-H-I-L-A-R. And it means a song of praise, and even more than that, it means a song, listen, of love. Now here's somebody being that's thankful. Thankfulness is the gateway into the room where God is, okay? In a Jewish mindset. And what is he bringing along? A song of love. Okay. A, a song of love. Thus, when we enter, and I just put we enter the courts with thanksgiving, with praise, we enter into the presence of God who shares his heart, his heart's desire with us as we do the same thing with him. It's an individual thing, not a corporate thing, okay? Not a corporate thing. So this Hebrew word is a song from the heart. Now I remember when Susan and I, I think I remember, it was so long ago, we're, we're, we're sparking before we got you know, dating, uh, before we got married, which, which had been 56 years ago or so. Okay, and and you know, I'd go over to her house, and and we'd sit in the, they didn't call it a den. I don't know. We'd overlook the 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 swimming pool at the house there, family room. I think they call it. And and you put some music on, nice melodious music, mood music, right? Mood music. You know, when I go down to my office here, uh, I generally, you know, I have a computer. And what I do is I go to YouTube and on YouTube, you can find so many different venues of music. It's unbelievable. But what I look for is background music. And generally it's Christian music. All right. Without words, just the music. And I play it very softly. Now, sometimes I'll play songs from the forest, It'll be birds and 
and things like that, you know. And it's just background music to, to, to fill in. So I don't feel like I'm, I'm by myself, actually, okay? But it's what we call mood music. And that's the idea of the praises here that these dear Jewish folks were desiring to give to God. Because God is what? His loving kindness. He is a lover of men, see? And the desire of God is for what? Us to love him just as he loves us. And I think we need to keep that in mind as, as, as we go through here, okay? So I think what verse four is actually expressing is this, your thanksgiving is a gateway to the heart of God where you can sing your love song to him, okay? Your love song to him. That's why the Lord says to, you know, to, to the folk, listen, go in your closet and pray. Get by yourself with God. That's what this is all about. So thankfulness toward God shows that our love for God is not selfish, okay? Not self-centered. It's not gimme, give gimme give love, okay? But rather when we come to God, it's, it's with humility and as much love as we have, have learned to have for a great God so he can share his with us. And that's what verse four here is all about. And that's why it was sung there uh, in the temple, okay, prior to the sacrifice there on, on the Fridays, the, the, the sixth day. It, it, it's interesting as, as you see that. Now, you think of this, John chapter 14, verse six, the Lord said, I am the way, the truth, Okay, and how, do, how does somebody get to the Father? Well, it's through, we understand today, it's through our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And he is what God wants us to enjoy and to have. He's given us the, his own nature, hasn't he? And so it's through our Lord Jesus Christ that we can come. How, though? Thankful for everything he's ever done for us. All right. Thankful for everything he's ever done for us. You know, when you read Hebrews 4.16, that's where Paul told the Jewish folks, you know, come boldly to the throne of grace. Now, for us today, now that was prior to the coming of our Lord, 70 AD, we don't have to go to the throne of grace. It's in us. He is within us, okay? And I think, you know, and my brother Tim's with us tonight, and Sandy, and Tim and I were talking uh, about, you know, one of the things concerning our Christian growth is finding out who we are and who God wants us to be. And I told Tim, I said, I think most Christians are afraid of that, okay? They re really are. And, and I don't know if they're afraid of God, but mainly it's probably because they're afraid of themselves, actually, okay? But we come to come to our great God knowing that he loves us. So we should come, how? With thankfulness. I heard uh, Dan Bongino, I was running some errands this, this afternoon for Susan. Uh, he says, isn't it amazing that... Uh, Tomorrow, we're going to give thanks. And then on Black Friday, you're going to go into the stores and people are going to be shoving and pushing each other out of the way, you know, to get to get the things they want to buy. Doesn't make sense, does it? That's why you and I don't, we don't worry about those things. But watch this. I want to, uh, I'm going to read you from a couple other translations here. Uh, the, the Passion Translation. Uh, I'll just start with one and come down to uh, four here or so. Now, get the idea here. Now, a lot of people don't like this translation. The reason being because it, it, it comes out of the Aramaic mostly. Okay. But what language did the uh, people in Palestine speak and the Lord speak? Aramaic. Came out of the Babylonian captivity and all that sort of thing. 
So here in, in <clears throat> Psalm 100, the writer has a poetic song for Thanksgiving. He says this in verse one, lift up a great shout of joy to Yahweh. Go ahead and do it. Everyone, everywhere. Worship Yahweh with gladness. Sing your way into his presence with joy and realize what this really means. We have the privilege of worshiping Yahweh our God, for he is our creator and we belong to him. We are the people of his pleasure. You can pass through his open gates with the password of praise. Come right into his presence with thanksgiving. Come bringing your thanks offering to him and affectionately bless his beautiful name. Affectionately see with love. For Yahweh is always good and ready to receive you. He's so loving that it will amaze you. So kind that it will astound you. He is famous for his faithfulness toward all. Everyone knows our God can be trusted for he keeps his promises to every generation. Now, you know, some say, well, that's a paraphrase. Well, that's all right. It, it's the idea we're, we're trying to get through here. Uh, uh, Jonathan Mitchell does the same thing in the Old or the New Testament. You know, he realizes that the Greek doesn't go exactly into the English, so he adds any words he can to make it flow, say. Now, Mr. Woos does the same thing. Now, I'm going to take you to the Message Bible, which Dan, my son Dan, got me hooked up. Uh, Eugene Peterson, I have a number of his books. Uh, uh, just tremendous man. Now, he's with the Lord now. But watch how he, he says this. Unknown caller. Oh, joy. Excuse me. The only people that call me are spam risks. <laughs> Okay, here's the, uh, okay, the Message Bible, Psalm 100 says this, and he has a note, a Thanksgiving Psalm. On your feet now, applaud God, bringing a gift of laughter. Sting or sing yourselves into his presence. Know this, God is God and God, God. He made us, we didn't make him. We're his people, his well-tended sheep. Enter with the password. And then in quotes he has, thank you. That's the password. Make yourselves at home, talking praise. Thank him, worship him. For God is sheer beauty, all generous in love, loyal always and ever. So do we have reason to be thankful to God? Certainly we do. You know that verse back in Timothy tells us he's a savior of all men, but especially them that what? Believe. Because those of us who believe have this opportunity to have that one-on-one -on -one fellowship with him. You know, becoming what God wants us to be and not being afraid of what God wants us to be. But the password is thankfulness, being thankful to God for all that he's done. We should never overlook that, folks, never overlook it.